Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Open Classroom. I'm Janet Gillow, the Director of Professional Development for the Brown School here at Washington University in St. Louis. And we are so happy to have you with us as part of today's Open Classroom program. For those of you joining on the Zoom webinar, you likely know this about the format by now, but we cannot see or hear the audience. However, chat is enabled and we very much want your questions and comments. Uh, there will be time for Q&A at the end of the program, but please feel free to throw thoughts into chat at any time they occur to you. I wanna extend a welcome to people joining on YouTube either right now through our live stream or maybe checking out this recording at a time that's more convenient for you. Um, we're delighted that you're taking advantage of this resource, but wanna make you aware that we're not able to moderate Q&A through YouTube. So before we get started with today's program, I just want to let you know we are going to be back on the air tomorrow, which is Thursday, April the 14th. Dr. Rupang Ann um, here at the Brown School is uh, delivering a program called Artificial Intelligence for Everyone. Um, so range of topics that we do here and everything is free and open to all. We hope you'll come back and I'll throw a link in chat to the website if you'd like to check that out. Uh, but now to get us started with today's program, it's my pleasure to turn things over to Dr. Fred Sewamala, the director of the International Center for Child Health and Development. Take us away, Dr. Fred. All right. Uh, uh, good afternoon, good evening, good morning. And, you know, I know that people are joining us from all over the world. Um, Janet, thank you so much uh, for hosting us uh, on um, uh, this channel. And uh, we, I want to introduce myself again. Uh, my name is Fred Sewamala. I'm um, the, the director of uh, the International Center for Child Health and Development, and I also direct uh, Smart Africa here. And I also happen to be the Associate Dean for Transdisciplinary Faculty Research here at Washington University. So first of all, I want to thank uh, Laura and her team for organizing uh, these um, uh, meetings and, and, and presentations because this is our last presentation this semester for iChad. And we then we'll resume next uh, semester. We'll take a break during the summer. During the summer, we are going to be doing a very big um, a training program. Uh, we'll, we'll do virtual here, but then we'll also travel to Uganda, and then we have a big conference. So you are all welcome for those ones who can travel or for those ones who want to join us virtually here. Now, um, we want to also to thank uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Juliet Sekandi uh, for making the time to present to us. Um, and it's my role was simply to say hi, uh, a few words, but I want to pass this on to Dr. Proskovia Nabunia, uh, who, is the, so, uh, who is a co-director of iChad to be able to introduce uh, Dr. Juliet Sekandi. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Fred, and welcome everyone to our last speaker series of the, of the semester. Um, as Dr. Fred mentioned, my name is Proskovia Navunya. I'm on the faculty at the Brown School, and um, I'm excited to introduce our speaker for today. Um, so before I go into uh, do, uh, Dr. Sekandi's amazing uh, oh, short bio, um, I wanted to mention that um, uh, Dr. Juliet and I met a few months ago over Zoom. So this was supposed to be a 30 minute you know, conversation, but we, we, you know, we ended up talking for over an hour. Um, you know, it was amazing listening to your work and, and where you want this work to go. And we are so very excited that you accepted our invitation to present today. So thank you so much. Um, so Dr. Juliet Sekandi is a physician scientist, a global public health expert um, and health services researcher in the field of tuberculosis, HIV and mobile health. And she's an assistant professor in the Global Health Institute and the Department of Epidemiology and Biostatistics and the College of Public Health, University of Georgia. Um, and Dr. Sekandi uses mixed methods to investigate ways to improve outcomes in patients with tuberculosis. Um, for more than 10 years, uh, her work has focused on developing strategies uh, for active case finding of undiagnosed tuberculosis and HIV um, infected persons, as well as facilitating referrals for effective care in urban communities in Uganda. And she has recently expanded her research to M Health, where she uses digital technologies to support patients to adhere and complete their prescribed TB treatment. The overreaching goal of her work is, is to improve clinical outcomes and prevent emergence of drug-resistant TB. 
Uh, Dr. Sekandi is also passionate about mentoring young scientists in uh, global public health research and testing health interventions for, uh, for low resource settings. So with that, Dr. Juliet will be, will be happy to learn that ICHAD has you know, multiple NIH funded research training programs for young researchers in Sub-Saharan Africa interested in global work, um, including one of our recently awarded achieve that Dr. Fred mentioned that will be launched in Uganda later this summer. So we, we, we are lining in that, you know, in that interest. So today, uh, Dr. Sakando will be presenting her, her work on harnessing the power of digital technology to support and improve treatment outcomes in patients uh, with tuberculosis disease in, in Uganda. So welcome, take it away, please. Thank you so much for that very kind uh, introduction, uh, Dr. Prosse. I'm so privileged to be here and uh, I'm in a virtual, but I feel like I'm there. <laughs> So I, I, I am so honored that I, I could come and, and, and join your uh, seminar today to talk about some of the work that I do. So I will go straight into my talk and hopefully I can um, stay within the allocated time. So I'm trying to move my slides. There's always that few kinks that happen as you try to move the slides forward, and which is going on right now. Okay, so let's see. Okay, so I wanted to uh, start off with acknowledgements and put, you know, sort of get those out of the way and then talk about a few uh, areas uh, related to, to the work that I've, I've been doing. And so with that, here are my two um, colleagues that I, without which, without whom this work would it have been possible that have made the work that I'm, um, you know, participating in in Uganda. And so I, I, I acknowledge them up front just because most of the work that I'm going to talk about is study related. It's a study that we have almost just completed a few months ago. And, and so I'm very privileged to have worked with Dr. Esther Bregea and uh, Dr. Sarah uh, Zaluango at, at the KCCA as, as we call it. And of course, without um, the, the entire team of, of support from, from the research uh, assistants to, to the consultants and partners, uh, both local and international, especially highlighting the Everwell Health solutions that have, has provided the technology that we have used, and a whole range of, of collaborators and contributors. And last and not uh, and least is, is the funding agency, which is NIH, that I would like to, to acknowledge for, for their support. So uh, tuberculosis remains a major global public health problem. Many times, uh, depending on where you live, you may not hear much about tuberculosis, for example, if you live in the US, it's, it's a rare condition. And so it's easy to think, oh, TB is a, is a thing of the past. But I start off with this uh, sort of um, uh, quote here, which says TB anyway, is TB everywhere, just because it's an infectious disease and it can travel on planes, it can travel, you know, it can be just a plane ride away from, from where you are. And depending on um, circumstances, it can very easily arrive uh, in a different destination. So again, uh, it's a very highly disproportionately distributed disease. And so, as I mentioned, as you can see in the dark areas, especially Sub-Saharan Africa and uh, Asia, Southeast Asia, they, they, the rates of, of TB, especially new cases, are very, very high. And uh, in, the, in the ranges of over 300 to even greater than 500 cases per 100,000, and when you compare that to areas like the US where you have almost uh, about four uh, to five cases per 100,000, there's a huge uh, stark difference in terms of uh, the burden of disease as, as, as would be refer to it. So again, just to give you that background, TB was, was the leading single infectious cause of death worldwide, resulting in 1.5 million deaths and uh, approximately 10 million new cases reported each year. So again, I say was the leading until COVID took over recently, as we all know, uh, at now 6 million deaths and approximately 500 million uh, cases uh, in just two years. And so to prevent TB and control TB, we must do several things. And all these bullet points that I list here are, are, are kind of, uh, you, you could think about them as programs that could help um, uh, mitigate uh, the, the problem of, of, of TB. And all these have been done. 
But clearly, you can see that given the numbers that we're talking about, we're talking about 1.5 million deaths, we're talking about 10 million new cases each year, there's still a lot of work to be done. There's a lot of unfinished agenda. So I'm not going to go through a whole list. You can read it yourself. But I wanted to kind of land on uh, the parts that I'm, I'm working on right now, which is ensure adequate adherence to prescribed treatment. And of course, uh, prefaced on the fact that we have TB treatment that's effective. It's been tested, it's, it's available, it's free for the most part. Of course, you know, if you're paying for insurance and whatnot, but at least in low resource settings, it's, it's free. It's access free of charge by patients who have been diagnosed. But, and we also know that 90% of patients can be cured with existing first line drugs. But patients must take at least more than 80%, 80% or more of the prescribed doses um, of anti-TB medications over a period of six to eight months to be cured properly. So that's, that's a big, big, big caveat right there. And so why am I interested in this? Uh, there is a big problem of, uh, of non-adherence. And so the WHO estimates that about 30 to 50% of TB patients fail to complete their uh, treatment as, as um, treatment doses as prescribed. And this poor adherence may lead to high risk of development of um, multi-drug resistant TB, which is, is a serious, serious issue because uh, the treatment of MDR is complex, uh, it's longer, it's more costly, it's more uh, toxic in terms of side effects. And of course, uh, there's a lower cure rate. And uh, in red, I highlight that because when, when patients don't take their medicines properly, then there's high mortality, especially if they're TBHIV co-infected, which is not uncommon, and ongoing transmission, of course, of TB from index to uh, index cases or index patients to, to their communities. So directly observed therapy, DOT, uh, as we call it, or DOT, is the standard of care. So this was established way back by the WHO in 1995 and ensures, and the goal was to ensure that you know, patients adhere to their treatment. So ideally, uh, this method, which is DOT, uh, involves face-to-face -face observation of a patient by a treatment supporter. And uh, this could be at home or at a health facility or within the community to confirm that the patient has actually taken their treatment. Again, remember, I told you that at least 80% of the doses must be taken properly to ensure that a uh, cure will, will actually occur. But you know, DOT is not feasible in most low-income settings uh, due to human and, and financial resources. So that's, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's not uncommon. I mean, it's not only due to uh, just referring to TB, but maybe other situations. So what's the solution? So the solution we are looking at is to modernize DOT and uh, use digital adherence technologies, which is from DOT to DAT. So these digital adherence technologies in TB management uh, help address um, the, the issue of, or at least mitigate the issue of increased rates of disease relapse, emergency of uh, multi-drug resistance and death, of course, that uh, very un un undesirable outcomes as far as uh, TB. Concerned. So close treat, treatment monitoring is critical and it facilitates timely detection of um, either poor outcomes, clinical response, and, and of course, uh, which may be the result, uh, which may lead into drug resistance. So again, some of the key things that could be done would be, for example, prompt change of the regimen. If somebody's not taking or not faring well on the treatment they're on, you'll be able to be able to make that clinical decision. Uh, but of course, on a public health scale, you're worried about morbidity and mortality associated with diseases, which could increase if somebody's not taking their treatment properly. And so that's have been shown to facilitate more patient-centered uh, care for um, uh, monitored medications and adherence. And that, you know, compared to the existing standard models that we have used, it's flexible, it offers patient uh, some autonomy and it's cost-saving. They don't have to travel back and forth. Uh, every time to meet with their um, uh, supervisor uh, 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 or treatment supporters. So that's have been evaluated in developed countries mostly, and there's been a lim just to a limited extent in uh, low resource uh, settings. Of course, several studies have been published, but they are few and far between, especially in low income countries. So we need more robust uh, research uh, to evaluate the data in terms of clinical effectiveness, accuracy, cost effectiveness and, and cost in low resource settings. We don't have that, that kind of data yet. Whereas the burden is very high in, in places like Uganda and you know, 
So how does um, how do these DATs function? The digital adherence technologies they do they can function in several ways. Of obviously as creative as you can get, but the basic basic ways that we use them is to you, you know send reminders. For example, that has been used for a very long time. Uh, mm -hmm. Reminders to the patients to take their medicines, facilitate real time uh, or synchronous observation of medication uh, intake, and also being able to compile patient dosing histories. How are they taking their medicine on day to day, week to week, month to month uh, timeline? And then also to be able to use that information to triage patients to places, uh, bump them up to get excuse me, to get more close attention or not sort of taper the, the amount of attention that you're giving them so that you're not wasting resources and time where patients don't need that much for intensive care. And of course, that then would lead to facilitating uh, provision of differentiated care or individual, individualized care. So, uh, so of course, uh, uh, against the background that yeah, we're talking about digital technologies, we are saying we can harness the power of digital technologies. So is it possible, is it feasible? Remember I said that DOT is not feasible because of financial and human resources, but for the, the, the intervention with digital technologies that we are proposing or that we are examining here, mobile phones have actually skyrocketed in terms of you know, ownership. We see a huge surge, the, the trajectory is upwards, it's going uh, higher and higher in terms of ownership. So there's this promise there. So you can see these data that are from Pure Research and, and they are a little old as you can see, but you can see the trajectory is, is really promising is in the direction that we, we want it to look uh, to go. So in terms of policy support, the WHO did endorse the use of digital technologies uh, in TB treatment and care in 2017. And they did publish and update the guidelines for treatment. And what I want to bring to your attention um, is just that highlighted part in yellow, which just says that uh, video observed treatment may replace DOT when um, uh, the video communication technology is available and it can be appropriately organized and operated by health providers and patients. However, they also caution that this is really, they are making this recommendation really, really based on very, very low uh, evidence, right? Very low certainty in the evidence, meaning that there's hardly any studies that have been done in the area or among, you know, based on the few studies, they are saying, okay, go for it. So what is VOT or VDOT? Uh, sometimes as we call it, I mostly like to call it VDOT, uh, Video Directly Observed Therapy. So it's, it's really a method of monitoring treatment and it's, um, it really involves using a smartphone app to record the daily medication intake, submit the videos to a health provider and the health provider reviews, as simple as that, reviews the videos and confirms that the patient has actually taken their treatment. So here is an overview of VDOT, a real quick overview before I delve into what we found. Uh, so we have a mobile app application which is used by patients to record medications video, medication videos on a smartphone. As I already said, there's a messaging system to send SMS reminders. There's a computer-based uh, system which is used by the health provider for the remote monitoring. And then, of course, for the purposes of A, seeing that the medications have been uh, taken, B, uh, uh, document the adherence, and then also document adherence, uh, sorry, side effects uh, as reported by the patients within the video. And then, of course, undertake actions, follow up actions. If a video is missed or somebody has reported side effects, then action needs to be taken. We don't just collect information for collecting it. We want to be able to use that same information and be able to address uh, the patient concerns. Okay, so this is what it looks like. Uh, so, figure of what it is. So, we have a patient facing side, which, of course, you see right here uh, is the, um, the, the phone. And that's the, the app, that's what the app looks like. And so the patient hits the app. Of course, we do a lot of training. Uh, those might be questions that might come later on. I won't go into all the details, but there's an app, patient hits the app, uh, shows their medication, uh, takes a video and then sends it. So once it's sent, uh, it's uh, date and time stamped, encrypted, and then uploaded onto a server. So that's the cloud, cloud server portion. And then on the provider facing side, the provider will log into a computer system and then will be able to find uh, access that go into the system, uh, find the particular patient's videos, observe them as you can see right here on the computer screen, and then confirm that yes, I saw the four pills being put in the mouth and being swallowed, and then confirm that this has been documented and whatever other follow up actions. Okay, so, so here uh, now shifting gears a little bit to tell you about the actual study. And what did we do? 
because there was zero information about this uh, VDOT in Uganda. We hadn't used it, we haven't used it in the national TB program. So we are trying to explore a new intervention that will help us overcome some of the barriers that we have seen. And so we wanted to identify the perceived barriers and benefits of VDOT uh, from both and uh, from the patients, health providers, and policymakers in the Ugandan context. Of course, that's very important. It's been tested in, in, in US, uh, it's been tested in Vietnam and, and in India and, and in UK, actually. So, but we haven't tested it in Uganda. We don't know what the Ugandan context uh, looks like in terms of accommodating this VDOT. So that's the reason why we wanted to identify this and we did formative research around that. And then of course, following that information, adapt the VDOT platform and then evaluate the effectiveness and then evaluate the patient experiences. So that is sort of the overall scheme. So here are the study components. We did three components, the uh, exploratory qualitative study, the randomized clinical trial, and then the explanatory qualitative study. So just a quick, uh, again, I'm just giving a quick overview, hoping that I, I would land at a place where we can have a, a, a rich discussion, hear your questions and comments actually, and more importantly, because I'm sure uh, this will help us to take the work forward. And uh, so again, uh, here is what we did. Uh, we uh, interviewed 86 participants, again, ranging from patients, health providers, and policymakers. As you can see, a whole range of uh, methods were used, and I mentioned that I used mixed methods, so focus group discussions, informal interviews, in-depth interviews. And these were the different uh, groups that we did uh, speak with and, and gather data. And so what did we find? So the perceived barriers that were raised uh, by, by the stakeholders, these are people who had not used VDOT at all. But we are saying, giving them a scenario and saying, this is what this method is supposed to help us do, observe patients, what do you think? And so the immediate thing that came out, of course, from the health providers was the, the concern with increased workload uh, for, for health workers. So again, I'm not going to read all the quotes, but for those of you who are fast readers, I've just sort of taken a yellow highlight and, and highlighted some of the things that will sort of point or, or collaborate with, with what I'm saying as the perception. And then of course they worried about the lack of equipment and technology devices. And then uh, they also were saying they were not, uh, there might be people who may not be able to operate a smartphone. And it's, it's a real thing because a smartphone is not commonplace, at least in Uganda, not for the general population, I would say. And then of course the, v, the fear that videos may be misused. So those were the major concerns. And I hear some, you know, I have some of uh, the, the, the supportive reports. Again, I'll not read each one of them word by word. And then what about um, other uh, concerns or barriers from health policymakers? So these were specifically from the health policymakers, people who hire up who make decisions about whether the national TB program should or could use uh, the digital technologies. So they immediately also, you know, highlighted the concern about increased workload for health, uh, health workers. And then of course, the lack of cellular network, internet and electricity in remote areas. So these are all sort of familiar things, but we wouldn't, couldn't have just assumed that those were the concerns that people were, were having, or, you know, would have concerning use, use of the digital technologies. All right, so what about the benefits? They did also perceive some benefits and, and these are the ones that came out uh, strongly. Of course, there are a lot of others, but they thought there would be an increase in, in confidentiality. There would be timely patient follow-up. There would be, um, video would be patient-centered. And again, highlighting that this is in alignment with what the National TB program is, is trying to do, moving away from policing patients. That was, I thought that was very, very interesting when uh, one of the uh, patients, I think, mentioned that. And then, of course, uh, the objective evidence of taking medicine. So again, you, you, you see this and you kind of, a conf you could easily wonder, com be confused a little bit and say, wait, wait a minute, I thought DOT was supposed to be in person, you're supposed to see the person. But because it's not feasible, then we kind of find a, another way of making that v, uh, that dot that the directly observed happen. And that is usually by self-report or some doses observed, some others not observed and, and so on and so forth. So, so now I'm um, again, shifting gears here. So part one formative we've learned what people are concerned about. And then now we, we take the, the digital technologies and try test it, see how effective can people actually use it. 
randomized people to a group that is using the usual care and uh, the other group using this new technology and see if we get uh, different results or meaningful results that can help us move this uh, forward into a programmatic uh, mode. All right, so again, here I'm summarizing what, what we did by showing you the concept diagram. Uh, we screened about 228 TB patients from various clinics around Kampala, and we were able to identify 144 that we randomized. So the, the rest were excluded. We had um, exclusion criteria, mainly age, uh, which was 18 to 65. And then, of course, being on TB treatment was a requirement so that we could be able to follow you up while you're in treatment, and it had to be at least within one month that you started so that we have a long enough duration to be able to learn some aspects about, about treatment. And so we are randomized to two groups. It was a parallel randomization, one, one to one, uh, 72 in the VDOT arm and 72 in the usual care. And then we had one exclusion because a patient up front said, no, I'm not taking my treatment. I'm not, I don't have TB then abandoned the treatment, didn't start at all, but we had already randomized them. So, and then on the other side, we didn't have outcomes. So we, we eventually have 71 in the VDOT arm and 71 in the initial care arm as an intention to treat analysis. So that's what I'll focus on. So here is our intervention. So I wanted to repeat this just so you know what people who were in the intervention arm received. They received a smartphone, which was paid for by, by the study. And of course, we downloaded a, v dot, a free VDOT uh, app, sorry, onto the phone. And then uh, the patient started receiving SMS text reminders uh, for medications intake uh, at 6 a.m. in the morning and as needed. So meaning as needed, if we saw that there was no video, the system was set up to send additional reminders based on the response. If somebody had sent their videos, then they, that's a person who didn't need additional reminders and so on and so forth. And then, of course, we had weekly internet uh, data bundles. This is very important because the system works on internet. So if somebody has internet on their phone, they, uh, they record the video, then it has to be downloaded, uh, sorry, uploaded onto the server. So that will require internet. Uh, so, and then, of course, the conditional weekly airtime incentive of uh, 1,000 Uganda shillings, which is about really 30 cents uh, US. So here is uh, the summary of our baseline characteristics. Again, I'm not going to go through all the details of the baseline characteristics. I'm going to highlight some of the things that I think are going to be relevant to understanding what the population looks like. So I highlight education here. So you can see that about even almost more than a third of our population, study population was, um, I mean, didn't have, a, had a, either no education or had just really primary education. And then you can see uh, the distribution, of course, mostly secondary education and, and so on and so forth. Uh, the other part that I want to draw your attention to is the cell phone ownership. So the cell phone ownership, you can see, as we already mentioned, when I showed you the mobile uh, cell, phone, uh, cell phone ownership in Africa, I said it was on an upward trajectory, which is you know, what, what is well known. But you can see right here in that figure that I showed you, we were around, Uganda was around 65 or Thereabouts. Now you can see cell phone ownership is about 83 among patients that have TB. So 83% of the patients reported that they did actually own a cell phone. Of course, among these, and I don't show the data here, but about 50%, roughly 50% did own smartphones, or roughly maybe under 50%, about 44% had uh, smartphones. So that is the uh, that's what the population looked like, and maybe if you're interested in employment, maybe uh, about 37% you know, uh, were unemployed. So what were the patterns of medication observation? I think this is one of uh, the, you know, the slides that begin to tell us what the results were. So on the left side of this figure, I do have the VDOT observation, and uh, the dark parts of the bar. So let, let me orient you a little bit. So on the, on the y-axis, we have the expected uh, videos that's on, I'm looking to my left, uh, the left of my, let me see if I have this little pointer here that I can use. Um, okay, so let's see. Is that the one? Oh no, it's not the one. Okay, so I'll not tinker with that. <laughs> I'll just leave it. Okay, so um, so we see that we have uh, on uh, the expected videos on the left side, uh, on, on the y-axis, and the little dark 
places, uh, the little dark parts of the, of the bars actually indicate the videos that were missed. And these are all individual level data. So these are 71 participants that were in uh, VDOT. And when you look on the opposite side, you see the usual care dot, uh, which shows you the dark parts showing uh, the doses that were, observed, were, were not observed. And the lighter parts or the gray part is what for each individual participant, uh, those were the doses that were observed. So again, stark difference right here that you see that um, indeed uh, people, you know, in VDOT did have a lot of their doses observed compared to those who were in the usual care. We want every dose to be observed. Why? Because we definitely uh, have to have an objective. We would like to have an objective way to say that the medications were taken because then if, if we don't have an objective way, then it means that we have to kind of guess and we will have to rely on self-reports. Do patients tell the truth when they are, when they've taken their medicines? Yeah, for the most part, I would say yes. But when we begin to see drug resistant TB, which is usually um, a result of not taking medications properly, then you begin to wonder whether the yes I took my medicines was real yes or had some mixture of yeses and noes. So that's why it's important. And down on the, the bottom part of the figure just really shows you um, the differences between male and female. Again, you could eyeball and say, well, male, maybe female did better in whichever arm, but again, I just leave that up to you uh, to sort of use your eyeball test and, and, and decide that. Okay, so moving forward, trying to move forward. Okay, so here I look at the fraction of expected doses observed, which we abbreviate as FIDO. And so uh, on top of this table, I show you the average or mean adherence, which was uh, 0 0.6, so you can see 60%. So meaning that 60% of uh, on average 60% of the doses overall uh, for all the patients were observed. But when you compare that usual care and VDOT, you find that 30% within usual care were observed, whereas 90% of the doses within VDOT were observed. And then the other part that I highlight here is where now we begin to differentiate what, what is good enough adherence. So if you're really to be strict and stay and measuring adherence by the number of doses that we observed, then you make that a cutoff, you know, the 80% or, or greater cutoff, you know, based on observation, this is what it would turn out to be like. So the way to read this is we are saying that overall, uh, about 56% of uh, participants did have uh, less than 80% of their doses observed compared to 44%. But when you stratify by the arm or the method of observation, you're seeing that uh, in VDOT, 9% or let's say 10% of uh, participants did have their doses observed at, um, sorry, my alarm is going off. So had 10% uh, of their doses observed when they're in, in usual care compared to 79% right here for VDOT. So that's an important finding right there. And we could extrapolate it many different ways. And there's lots of discussions we can have whether observing the doses strictly means patients took medicines or not. I don't think it is, but again, it's, it's, a, it's an indicator. It's a pointer to some of the gaps and areas that we need to examine a little bit more closely. Okay, so here I show that you know, figure, usually sometimes a figure conveys uh, information much easier. So the same information that I'm showing you is what was in the table here, just so you can see 44% overall at 80% of their doses observed, 79 in VDOT, 10% in UC DOT. But when you ask patients on top of the observation, can you tell us about the other doses that were not observed? Did you take the medicine, yes or no? So now you see that VDOT, uh, you know, the, the, the adherence goes up if you're measuring by observation 95%. The V dot goes up even higher above uh, 79. And the usual care dot, which was 10%, if you're using observed doses, goes up to 95%. So the self report boosts the adherence. So again, uh, moving on, I, I will have some discussions hopefully later on. But here I'm showing you some other important outcomes as far as the TB program is concerned. So what, what did we see? We see 
Loss to follow up is important to TB programs. They look at it. We had seven losses to follow up. One was from VDOT, six were from usual care. We had five deaths. One was from uh, VDOT, four were from uh, usual care. And then treatment completion, uh, we had 132 individuals completed their treatment. Uh, 70, which was 90%, 97% uh, in VDOT, and then about 86% uh, in, in usual care did complete their treatment. So again, moving on, I, we did a, a logistic regression and we looked at uh, the likelihood of uh, completing uh, treatment as far as uh, our definition of greater or less than 80% is concerned. And we can see that uh, patients who were in VDOT and that's the first line over here in the table, were eight times more likely to have 80% or greater of their medication doses observed compared to usual care. And then the other important finding that we have is uh, what's quite striking to me, I didn't expect it to be that way, but it was informative, was that one um, you know, people who did own cell phones had a 1.6 time times higher likelihood of having a higher um, observation rate, or which is 80% or more of their doses compared to those who did not have. So this was regardless of method of observation. So that points to the importance of having a, a, a technology device, regardless of whether you have this, the study-based one or you're being monitored with it, there might be some underlying uh, facilitation, just having a phone in your in your hand to be able to connect and contact people who, who are helping you or supporting you in treatment. That's, that's, that would be my discussion point around there, but we can go deeper in that. So those are the main findings. And so I wanted to now shift and highlight some of the, 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 the reasons for missed videos. I'm sure when we are learning about this technology, anyone would want to know, are people doing what they're supposed to do with the technology? And if not, why not? So this table here is a summary of that. And uh, from left to right, we have the reasons. And then uh, the next column shows you the number of patients reporting. So of course that will not add up to 144 because different patients report different reasons at different times. And then the total vid videos miss due to that reason. And then of course the percentage of the overall videos. Um, so if, yeah, percentage of overall uh, videos. So, so you can see uh, that I, I, I've tried to color code this to make it a little bit easier to, to digest. I arranged it from highest to lowest. Uh, for example, phone batteries not being charged, not, not surprising was, you know, contributed the highest. 21% 20, of the videos that were not sent or were missed were due to, due to the reason that batteries were not charged. And then you can go down the list. But what I wanted to do is to try and summarize for you uh, these results in just using the color coding. Uh, so the salmon color, uh, let me start with the green color, of course, summarizes all the technology best reasons. And so you can see that 51% of the reasons for missed videos were due to technology, or at least had technological relation. And then the salmon color, which uh, shows uh, other reasons which are patient related. So those are about 37% of the reasons uh, of the videos that were missed were, were due to uh, patient related, either behavior, took meds but forgot, traveled to a place with no power, uh, too ill to record videos, but took meds, too busy, location not convenient, all those are speaking about patient relationships, uh, patient related reasons. So that's sort of how uh, to take away. So the real, uh, so the takeaway message is in these uh, little uh, call outs, 51% technology related, 37% uh, patient related reasons. Okay, so that's uh, for the RCT. And now we are sort of landing on the last uh, block uh, of our study, which is the exit uh, qualitative uh, uh, interviews that we conducted at, uh, at the end when people completed the study. We wanted to learn lessons, obviously, because you know this is a, the very first study that has been done in Uganda among TB patients. Uh, a lot of unknowns. We went in not knowing anything, didn't know how it would work. So we did do a, an evaluation with patients specifically. We didn't yet examine the providers, but we focused more on the patients. So we did about, uh, I believe it was 42 
yeah, 42 interviews uh, with uh, different patients. Of course, uh, we heavily weight, weighted it on the V dot because that's the new thing. The usual care we know it's been done for about 30 years, so we know for the most part what's going on there. And and then, but we also wanted to hear what their perspectives were. So so yeah, that's that's the distribution. And then here we are with uh, some of the things that came out. Again, summarized, highly summarized. A uh, lot of information that we collected, which was very interesting and a lot to learn from. But uh, here, the, one of the main messages was having a cell phone made it easy for patients to get needed support from families or from the family, right? And so again, I highlight uh, what I, I call out as, as some of the things that speak to that. And the person is saying, oh, I, I, oh, it was always easy for my sister and my mother to call me and check on, on, check on me and even send me food and drinks whereas before it wasn't possible. And then the airtime incentive, remember we give airtime incentive if people sent their videos, enhanced social connections and uh, e.g. calling friends uh, for support. And yeah, so again, that's another point there. And then the internet was used to find ways to control and cope with stress. So a person saying they downloaded games and TikTok, and of course I'm sure they had time you know, laughing and just, just relieving uh, stress and, you know, avoid thinking about TB. And then the other part that's, that stood out was the uh, V dot phone reduced stigma towards, um, towards TB diagnosis, which I found very, very interesting uh, because a person said I was happy about receiving a phone because when I reached home, all the people I stay with said they will go and test for TB. Usually people don't say that in the community. They want to shun the person who has a TB diagnosis, they don't want to come near them. But now look how they're saying, oh, I also want to go. But of course, the motives might have been different. Clearly, you can see they wanted to be given a phone. But hey, if it, it causes people to not stigmatize others in the community, that's a good thing. And then um, a V dot uh, phone had an indirect economic benefit to the family. Uh, my mother used to keep the medicine as she, um, she could make sure I take it every day. And when she's uh, seeing, uh, when she's seeing, but when I got the phone, she left the phone to monitor me and she had time to concentrate on her work. And so the same with this lady, I didn't highlight things, but the point being the, the husband was a border border rider. For those of you who have been to Uganda to Africa know what the border border is. And so instead of coming home back and forth, checking on her, he would just call and say, oh, how are you doing? What can I get you? kind of thing, instead of distracting his work schedule to come home several times to check on the wife. So the wife did mention that that was a big, big help uh, to help the husband keep doing his work. So what about, um, what challenges, of course, we wanted to learn a lot about the challenges. Uh, so not surprising, some of the ones that were highlighted at the beginning when we uh, interviewed people is what came out, poor phone and internet network, was one of those that were mostly highlighted. Worries about uh, smartphone theft. And what about too many SMS reminders? So in this case, the way we had set up the system, we wanted the SMS reminders to stop as soon as the video came, but the SMS reminders kept going. So this was telling us uh, on our side, the technology side of, of things did not work as we expected it to, to work. And then what about stigma? So it's interesting, stigma came up uh, in the V dot side, but um, in, the, in the benefits, but it also came up in the concerns. So reminder messages could be accessed by other persons. So person is saying, I'm a driver, if I have medicines and, and then I'm, I'm, I'm receiving messages, the person who is next to me can read my messages and know what's going on. And then of course, with recording videos look strange, uh, difficulty in finding a private place for a video. So again, while others saw it as a, an easy thing to do, you do it on your own. If a person is working in a market, for example, and has a phone and has to find the lighting, a place that is well lit up to take a video, that can become a challenge and that can, in fact, uh, propagate um, the stigma, or perpetuate stigma. And then we also, I, I summarize a few things from the usual care. I wanted to hear what the usual the group that was in the usual care was saying. And so they said lack of treatment support. I did not have a treatment supporter. 
uh, this person is saying uh, for them to fill in their paper. I told them my auntie will be sup my support. So here at the beginning of uh, recruitment, when they are being registered for treatment, they ask you who is going to be your treatment supporter. So that person is saying, they just said somebody's name, um, the auntie's name, but knew that wouldn't be there. So I think without a treatment support, the video would help me to keep in touch with the health workers for guidance. And then of course the Sigma associated uh, with, with health workers visiting uh, their homes, health workers visit me, but I was uh, always worried that my boss will, uh, will at one time ask me, why, why are they visiting? So again, you can see uh, some of those. Again, I've gone over them rapidly just so I can leave time for us to have a discussion and maybe answer some questions. Uh, but in conclusion, we can see that um, a VDOT did uh, really um, play a positive role for the most part uh, in delivering patient-centered care. Uh, patients using VDOT were more likely to have favorable adherence as measured by observation of medication compared to those who are using uh, usual care. And then patients who own phones were more likely to have a higher level of adherence regardless of observation method. And then VDOT uh, intervention was a strong facilitator of family support for TB patients, and then could also play a role in reducing or increasing. So again, there it's a gray area because it came from both sides as a benefit and also as a challenge, um, and increasing anticipated uh, stigma for TB in the community. And then of course, a small weekly incentive. People praised the, the, the incentive as something that really, really boosted their their connections and was very helpful in, in keeping in touch with, with others. And so final slide here, um, uh, some recommendations that we made was that for video to scale up uh, community resources such as patients own, you know, personal mobile phones could be leveraged to strengthen patients in that adherence um, and support uh, public private partnerships between TB program and telecom companies to support the technology infrastructure. And then the TB program could consider including small incentives in, in TB, in the TB patient management package to support adherence to treatment. And then of course, implementation research uh, into the process and timing of VDOT to achieve the greatest effectiveness on clinical outcomes is needed. And then of course, further research um, on, on subgroups of patients who could benefit the most uh, from DATS, for example, those with multi-drug resistance or a certain group uh, that is, is working jobs where they need to travel far from town, they can't be observed. So there, there could be a tailoring, a further or finer tailoring of who uses what subgroup. It's not a one size fits all, I guess that's the message because obviously there, there's still challenges. It's not a magic bullet, it's not a silver bullet, but it still has, uh, it has some benefits that could be leveraged. And so with that, I, We'll turn it back. Uh, my time was going off. Uh, thank you so much for listening. I welcome any questions and comments and feedback. Thank you. Dr. Sakandi, thank you so much. Your timing was impeccable. <laughs> that was amazing. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much for-, for And that. it was really fascinating um, hearing more, learning more about TB, which isn't um, something that you know we grapple with too right. intensively here in the United States. So thank you so much. We do have some questions in the chat, so let's get started. I'll just take them in the order they were posted, um, and I, I'm happy to read them out loud. Yeah, sure. if that's helpful. Yeah, that's um, sure. From Dr. Tutlam, this is very promising. This is a very promising program. How do we overcome the challenge of access to smartphones for the 50% that don't have them? and internet access to be able to scale up this program, especially in low resource settings. Mm -hmm. So can, can I go one by one? Is that fine? Okay. Yeah, so that's a question that has been asked and, uh, you know, several times when I give this talk. And, and, and for me, I, I see the, the, the promise of progress is, is real because uh, there's definitely no turning back in terms of, of, of the technology. And I think COVID helped us some to accelerate that, that, that mindset and that paradigm shift, I would say. And so the smartphones, as I, I've highlighted in one of the recommendations, one, we can start with using the ones that are in the community. So the patients do have phones. Family members, we do have data that I didn't show, 
most of them live within households where there are other individuals that own smartphones. It's not them, but either the spouse or a sister or a child, whoever it is in the same household. So the, the, the issue of, of shared phones, I know becomes a little bit dicey when you're thinking about stigmatizing uh, kind of uh, situations. But, but I'm, all, all the point I'm making is um, the phone ownership, the smartphone um, ownership is only going to grow over time. So that might be a short-term problem, but if there is a way that we can find um, funds that can help support patients, and, and this is what we told our patients, we are giving you this phone, it's, a, it's hospital equipment, and we want you to return it so that we can use it to support another patient. So we made that clear up front. So we, we are providing this as a piece of equipment, but use it for supporting your treatment. So the program could you know, support the, most, the ones who mostly need to be supported that way. Other patients could bring in their own phones and we download a smartphone, I mean, a, an app on their own smartphones. And we have done that before in the pilot that we did. We, we saw that it works. It has a few challenges, but I think it's something that can be also taken advantage of. And then the internet aspect also, it was surprising to me though, when, when we looked at the cost of the internet, and again, there is also much, much work that is being done in laying down the technology infrastructure, even in Uganda, in terms of increasing the bandwidth and all those same things, it's going to come over time, but the cost is not as high as we would have expected it to be. For example, for giving a patient one a week enough you know, internet that's worth for a week's treatment, we needed one, one, uh, um, one dollar, which is 3,500 Uganda shillings. So even partnering with technology or te telecom companies that are actually producing those products, there could be a way to tap into their, uh, what do they call it, corporate social responsibility funds. And they say, we are going to fund you know, 10,000 patients to fund 10,000 patients to complete treatment for six months, that's $24 per patient for internet, for the internet bundles, you see. So just breaking it down, and right now we are doing a cost analysis and a cost effectiveness analysis. So probably putting the, some numbers to some of those things that seem like they're far out of reach um, could, could help. And so I, I know I've sort of <laughs> had given a lengthy, uh, um, a lengthy uh, answer, but I, because it's been asked so many times and I'm, we are trying to grapple with several different ways. So, but I think it's going to be really a combination of approaches with the community involved, the patients bringing in their own resources, private partnerships, and those sorts of things. Creative thinking around that. Great, thank you. Um, Dr. Chizito has a question. He has two questions. I think you kind of addressed the second one, but I'll go ahead and read them both. Thank right. you for the very elaborate presentation. What are your findings on the adherence for HIV TB co-infected patients mm -hmm. given the duo pill burden? And then he asks, can you comment on the scalability and sustainability of the <laughs> intervention? Right, that's, that's a good, good, good question right there. Yeah, so it didn't, uh, for the TB HIV co-infection, I was very interested in, in, that, um, in that group as well. Uh, because my hypothesis going in was that the patients that do have a very high pill burden are likely not to adhere. So in general, you would think because of the pill burden, and, and that has been shown by other studies. But in our study, we did not find a difference between whether somebody had TB alone or had both TB and HIV. Their adherence was, 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 not, dif was not different between groups, between those two groups. So the scalability and sustainability is the, <laughs> I see they say the, the elephant in the room, right? So we're just beginning to generate evidence, number one. And so one of the things that I alluded to in the recommendations, I say we need to conduct some uh, implementation research and see maybe there are even more efficient ways to implement this VDOT. My take right now is that this method will probably not be a one size fits all. There are patients who are most likely to benefit from it 100%. And maybe there are others who do not even need any observation. They're already good on their own. You give them their pills, they're good. They're going to swallow their medicines from A to Z for six months and they're good. So you don't give, you don't need to give those VDOT, right? 
and you don't even need to have a treatment supporter for them. But to identify those subgroups that are actually struggling and need a little bit additional support, I would uh, think about um, developing models for, for that. But again, we need evidence. We can't just say, okay, it's, it's more uh, the women or it's more the men or it's more the young or the adults without actually doing um, the, the due diligence of, of, of generating the evidence that will inform us accordingly. So still, still, still very early um, in the process for me to say what it will look like in terms of uh, scalability and sustainability. But again, the resources, and, and this is what I told the National TB Program in Uganda. I, I did present this work um, a few weeks ago, maybe early in, in February. And I said, there has to be a commitment, a real commitment to build capacity for, for this work. If, if we think digital technologies are the way to go, if they have a place, they have promise, we have to then make the resources, uh, we have to commit the resources to build capacity for it and to put infrastructure in place. Because with technology, we are not going back. We are, we are really going to move forward and, and make sure that these, these plans for, for that. Thank you. I hope I understand answered the question. Yeah. Yeah. So but yeah, that's that's my take. And, and thank I'm, you so much. Anyone, you know, Dr. Chizito uh, jumping in and contributing your own ideas. Um, we're still <laughs> <laughs> wisdom. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, we'll just keep going down the list because um, we have, you know, just a couple minutes left and a lot of good questions. Um, mm -hmm. Dr. Fred Sewamala asks, um, thanks for an excellent presentation. In regards to stigma, were the phones owned by their participants or some participants simply had access to the phones? I know you addressed that a little bit, but just clarifying. Mm. And yeah, then his, the second part sorry. was how do you deal with students since this is not part of the exclusion criteria, especially mm. those in boarding schools? Mm. 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 And then he has a third question, but maybe wow. you want to tackle those first two. <laughs> okay, all right. Excellent, excellent questions that are coming uh, from the audience. I really appreciate the thoughtful uh, questions that people are, are bringing on because they help us to think a little more clearly about, about this, this work. And so for, for Dr. Uh, Siwamala's uh, question about stigma, one, the, the phones that were in, in the VDOT group were given by the study. So we made sure that we put a, a smartphone in every single participant who was randomized to, to, the, to, to, the, to the study arm, but we required them to bring back the phone after treatment was, was done. And of course it had a pin that they would use to enter the app, it wasn't just anyone at, at home would just go, go into their app and see what's, what's there, but they had to use a, a PIN code to, to enter their, their information and be able to record videos. And then what was the second question, remind me? Um, how did you deal with students? Oh, that, yes, yes, yeah. students, very good. So interestingly, we had, so I, I, I would almost say COVID helped, students were at home, so in the time of study, so they were not at school, but then one student I think that was in a private school was able to take the phone to school and he was randomized to the video arm, had very, very interesting experiences, had to go to the nurse because that's where his TB meds were and explain to, to her that I'm actually in a study and I'm required to show the, the doctors or the providers that I'm taking my medicines and they did allow him to do that. Uh, so he then started taking the meds in class. Then the students actually made fun of him because they were like, why are you taking, you, what strange disease do you have? Why are you taking recording yourself? But then after that, he got the confidence and overcame that, that stigma and, and the questioning that was going on. And he actually was able to educate. Now he became the educator about TB to his fellow students. So again, the student took the phone to the school, was able to charge it, was allowed, was given permission, said the, the health providers asked me to take, bring this phone and be able to use it. And the school was okay for him to charge the phone, use it for recording and then put it away. Great, thank you. So these, Talks go by so fast. I wish we had another yeah. half hour to answer these questions. I'm sorry. It really, 
it's never a great feeling to leave these some wonderful questions unanswered, but um, yeah. thank you so much, Dr. Sekandi, for your amazing talk. It was really interesting and generating a lot of questions, and um, mm -hmm. I hope we'll, we'll get to hear more from you. Um, and I know I'm sure you've piqued the interest of a lot of our students and participants in the audience to kind of mm -hmm. follow your work and see what, what's next with this um, oh great God. use of technology. Mm -hmm. And and no. Laura, if you don't mind, I, I I would appreciate if you just download all this. And I can I could do that actually from from the chat and copy all the questions and just take a look at them into my own and and the team. Absolutely. Uh, the ones that haven't had a chance to 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 answer. Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Maybe I, I might. Have. Yeah, these an hour is never um, enough time. But yeah, yeah we'll I, make sure. Um, I'll work with our partners to get those questions for you and. Um, Thank you so much. I'm, we're going to wrap it up here. Yeah, I just want to thank you very much for your time and for sharing and collaboration and for wrapping up our speaker series um, as our last featured um, speaker of the season. Um, and you're getting a lot of thanks and praise and um, gratitude in the chat. So thank you um, for having me. And I truly appreciate uh, all the questions and the great audience that it has been. Great.